Hello everyone, as part of our initiatives webinar series, I'd like to thank you for joining us today for this very special live broadcast. My name is Emily Eberly with Sachs Healthcare Communications, and I'm your technical producer. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, Respiratory Compromise, Risk Prediction on the General Care Floor. And now I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Carla Youngquist, who is our moderator today. Carla is Associate Professor at the University at Buffalo School of Nursing and is a nurse practitioner at the Thompson Health Sleep Disorders Center. Her research interests are in the interaction of opioids, pain, and sleep disordered breathing. At the Thompson Health Sleep Disorder Center, she has over 10 years of experience in diagnosing and treating patients with sleep disorders. She currently serves on the American Society for Pain Management Nursing Expert Consensus Panel and is the lead writer for clinical practice guidelines for monitoring patients at risk of opioid-induced respiratory depression. Carla, welcome, and I'm so glad to be working with you for this special session. And we thank you for all of your support in moderating this important webinar for so many people today. Are you ready to get started? Thank you, Emily, for that kind introduction. And thank you for, uh, for everyone for joining the webinar on respiratory compromise, risk prediction on the general care floor. Uh, speaking on this topic are two leading experts and colleagues of mine, Dr. Frank Overdyke and Dr. Ashish Khanna. Dr. Overdyke is a professor of anesthesiology in Charleston, South Carolina. His area of expertise is in opioid pharmacology and respiratory depression. He has lectured extensively on this topic and as on patient safety indices, and his passion is to reduce preventable harm from late detection of respiratory compromise of all etiologies. Uh, through continuous monitoring of vital signs. Dr. Khanna is Associate Professor of Anesthesiology at the Wake Forest School of Medicine and an anesthesiologist intensivist at the Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. He serves on several editorial boards, including the Journal of Critical Care and Annals of Intensive Care Dr. Khanna has published extensively in peer-reviewed journals on several perioperative topics, including opioid-related uh, respiratory complications and the prediction of and monitoring for cardiorespiratory complications within the uh, and uh, within inside and outside of the ICU. Uh, Dr. Overdyke and Dr. Khanna uh, would like to disclose that uh, they are on the steering committee of the Prodigy clinical trial at, that was supported by Medtronic. Both of them are also consultants uh, for Medtronic. This educational program was provided in part by an unrestricted educational grant provided by Medtronic. To obtain CME, CNE, CRCE credits will be available at the conclusion of the webinar. Uh, this uh, is, uh, they will provide education, continuing education for physicians, and this is the accreditation statement. Uh, continuing education for nurses, nurse anesthetist, and respiratory therapist is also provided, and this is their accreditation statement. I'd like to turn the uh, presentation now over to our two speakers. Uh, Dr. Overdyke, are you ready? Yes, Carla. Uh, thank you, and good afternoon, everybody, and good morning to the folks on the West Coast. Let's start by reviewing the objectives uh, of my section here. We're going to discuss the incidence and adverse outcomes associated with respiratory compromise on the general care floor, and then the role of continuous monitoring in the detection and prevention of respiratory compromise, with some examples of the technologies that we can currently use to do so. So this is the definition of respiratory compromise that the Respiratory Compromise Institute created and in my opinion is the most accurate and helpful. 
Respiratory compromise describes a deterioration in respiratory function in which there is a high likelihood of decompensation into respiratory failure or death. So that speaks to the seriousness of this event, but for which timely specific interventions might prevent or mitigate decompensation. So this speaks to the preventability of these events. Let's start with some literature uh, on the incidence of respiratory compromise. And this is from the Resuscitation Journal by Lars Anderson and his colleagues, entitled Acute Respiratory Compromise on Wards in the United States. As you can see, the definition is very similar to the one we just saw, except they add the qualifier acute. Acute respiratory compromise, absent agonal or inadequate respiration that requires emergency assisted ventilation, including non-invasive or invasive airways. The data analyzed here was from Get With The Guidelines Registry, which is what all you know, uh, probably know is the AHA's Registry of Cardiopulmonary Arrests. It now has specific data on respiratory arrests as well. So we can prime those out from the full cardiopulmonary arrests. But what you can see from these data is that we, they estimate we have over 44,000 cases of acute respiratory compromise on the ward per year. And you can see that the mortality is extremely high at 40%. Now, my specific interest and expertise, as Carla said, is in respiratory compromise caused by opioids. And I'll present some anecdotal cases that are perfect examples of why we should respiratory compromise in the ward is potentially avoidable. This is Brian. He's, Brian suffered a hand injury and was admitted for surgery in a community hospital, but the hand surgeon could not get to till the next day. So they placed them on the ward overnight and prescribed morphine for pain. After repeated calls for inadequate control of pain in the middle of the night, a physician assistant changed the order from morphine to Dilaudid, but escalated the morphine equivalent dose by greater than tenfold at a single shot. Not aware of the potency ratio of seven to one, as you probably know, between Dilaudid and morphine. And Brian suffered a respiratory arrest, which would likely have been detected had we monitored him continuously and prevented a hypoxic brain injury. Now this next slide is going to be a little busy and you can digest it at your leisure, but I'm just it just reinforces a couple of the points. Respiratory compromise on the ward is frequent. Respiratory compromise is often unrecognized. Ward patients, as you know, lie behind closed doors, they're halfway down the hallway, and we only monitor vital signs typically every four hours. Respiratory compromise also leads to bad outcomes. High morbidity, high mortality. 2.4 times as many uh, as, as high a risk of dying in a hospital when your SpO2 goes below 90%. And this last uh, bar, continuous monitoring will likely improve outcomes. Now there, this column has some evidence in the literature that supported continuous monitoring prior to the Prodigy study. But Dr. Kana is gonna tell us the details what we found in the Prodigy study that supports continuous monitoring. I would like to remind everybody that the Agency for Healthcare Quality and Research in 2001 created patient safety indicators. Now what are PSIs? There are measures that screen for adverse events that patients experience as a result of exposure to the healthcare system, i.e. our patients. These events are likely amenable to prevention by changes at the system or provider level. It's not always somebody's fault, sometimes there's system issues, but they are preventable. That is the key part. And I draw your attention to a couple of these PC, uh, the PSIs here. Namely, number four, failure to rescue. You're all, you've all you heard that term. That includes conditions such as pneumonia, sepsis, and cardiac arrest. And all these manifest early as respiratory distress, eventually respiratory compromise. Obviously, PSI number 11, you can see there, post-operative respiratory failure uh, as well. The number of patients we fail to rescue, if you look at the denominators and the numerators of these quotients, is really significant. There is a tiny little link at the bottom of this slide that I want you to go to and look at your hospital report. It's every hospital in the U.S. reports these. And you may be surprised at what goes on, but it's, it's good data to have. Now, I'm sure you uh, work at a hospital where you have a rapid response team. These were universally adopted in 1999 after the Incident of Medicine Report, Incident of Medicine Report in 1999, sorry. It took a few years for the IRTs to get established, 
but I'm just going to review what the intention was, and that is to allow earlier identification and treatment of respiratory compromise. As you know, the rapid response team has two limbs, an afferent limb, or what we call the detection limb, that has as its input some vital signs, which unfortunately happen only every four hours, some lab values, typically EMR data, and sometimes these are uh, uh, distilled into an early warning score as well. That is meant to trigger an efferent limb, the action limb, so to speak. That's where an intensivist and a critical care uh, individual, a physician or a nurse, comes to respond. Well, how successful have these RRTs been in reducing uh, serious harm and improving response time? This is an analysis that uh, Dr. Brad Winters at Hopkins did in 2013 that summarizes the effectiveness of rapid response teams at that time, 2013, so six years ago. But it shows you that all the data that we'd established in the literature at this point. They're shown on a forest plot. I like forest plots. They're easy to understand. Basically, the study shows no improvements in death before and after an RRT deployment. The risk ratio will be one, or is that dotted line down the middle? The strength of evidence supports fewer deaths with an RRT if the size of the dot at the middle of the bar is large and the width of the bar for the study is narrow and it move, it's on the left side. The further to the left of the, rep, rep, uh, the risk ratio of one, the dotted line is, and the narrower the bar, the better the performance of the RRT. And so a study whose bar spans across the dotted line is not convincing. That means possibly there's no advantages of the RRT. So what you see from this chart is that uh, the studies for the RRTs at that point had shown some reduced death rates, but not dramatically, since a number of these lines are very wide and they span across the middle. And that is confirmed by this, pay, this uh, slide that we have here uh, from Sarah Perman, who used the Get With The Guidelines Registry to measure the survival rate after cardiopulmonary arrest. Uh, this is data from 2003 to 2010. As you can see, the trends for both the ICU and on the wards are for improving survival over the years. But before you get too excited, I want you to look over here. Look at this Y denominator. 20%. We may have come, gotten better, but we're still at 20%. Only one in five patients on our wards survive. More shocking is that if you have an arrest in the ICU, you're more likely to survive than if you have an arrest on the ward. Now, how can that be? Don't we have our sickest patients at the ICUs? Aren't patients on the wards the ones that we think they have a little chance of having a catastrophic outcome? And that's precisely my point. This lovely lady is Jadine, who was in the hospital for a partial bowel obstruction, required an NG tube, which was painful, uncomfortable, and she was given prescribed morphine. Her bowel obstruction resolves, and she's to go home the next day, but she's kept on the morphine, because as you all know, sometimes it's easier, easier for us to put orders in than to get them discontinued. She was found in the respiratory arrest and died a few hours before she was to be discharged. Tragic case, very preventable. Now. As far back as 2010, the folks who invented the rapid response team came to the following conclusion when they met uh, about the afferent limb, so that's that first limb. And they had the following conclusions. Vital signs predict, predict risk. Well, I guess that's why we call them vital signs. They concluded that monitoring patients more effectively might improve outcome, although some risk is random. Okay. And pay attention to the last part of that. Some risk is random. We cannot predict which patients will have an unusual catastrophic event 100% of the time. And lastly, they agreed that if practical and affordable, all should, patients should be monitored continuously. Now, I take exception to the statement. If I'm on a hospital ward on a morphine PCA, I expect the hospital to protect me from any kind of catastrophic event, such as respiratory compromise, not just if it's practical and affordable to the hospital. There's some more data that suggests that we may, may not be doing things completely right. This data from Sun in 2015 confirms what we, uh, what we know, which is when it comes to hospital patients, what we don't know does hurt us. Here they tracked vascular patients with continuous pulse oximetry for three days post-op. But the bedside providers were blinded to the 
pulse ox display. So they didn't see the monitor. And when they looked at the tracings, they found that over a third of the patients had prolonged episodes of hypoxia that were not noticed or even recorded by the nurses in 90% of the cases. Now, they have excellent nurses at the Cleveland Clinic. This is not individuals, as I said earlier. This is a system issue. But spot check recordings, readings don't tell you what happens with the patients when you turn your back and you leave the room and you close the door. Another study by Lori Lee and colleagues back in 2017 looked at how much time had passed between the last nursing check and the time of a respiratory arrest or cardiopulmonary arrest. You see these bars here. Most frequently, a quarter of an hour to an hour had elapsed between the last nursing visits and the arrest. But in a number of cases, it was as little as less than 15 minutes here, this bar. This is the most common. And as you can see, most of these arrests occur well within the four-hour interval of the monitoring vital signs that we use as our standard of care at the moment, which I call our substandard of care. This is our four-hour interval. Most of these arrests happen before that. Very diff Some risk is random. So planes have been in the news lately. And all planes have black boxes, such as this, uh, which is actually orange. The black box lets us learn retrospectively what happened to the plane before the crash. So with continuous monitoring, vital sign monitoring, particular respiratory monitoring of our ward patients, we could do better. We can not only figure what happened to them when they have a respiratory arrest, but it'll show us what happened in the minutes before that, and it might be able to prevent us and warn us of decompensation. So I told you I was going to tell you which organizations are recommending now monitoring patients continuously on the ward. And you may recognize some of these. The ones in blue recommend continuous monitoring of at least pulse oximetry and or ventilation uh, for patients deemed at high risk of respiratory compromise. So uh, Joint Commission, CMS, ISMP, etc. I won't go into the detail uh, what these high risk patients are, but you probably know that they include patients with obstructive sleep apnea, patients who are morbidly obese, patients who have COPD, patients who may be difficult to control with opioids, such as chronic opioid patients. The organization Orange believed that risk triage, triaging should not be what determines who gets continuous respiratory monitoring, but all patients deserve continuous monitoring. Remember that the experts on the rapid response team said, if practical and affordable, all patients should be monitored should be continuously monitored. And these organizations in Orange agree with me that uh, when you pay more for a hospital bed than you do for a bed at the Ritz-Carlton, that you should be able to be spared an unexpected death or hypoxic brain injury. I look at this guy. Tom, this guy was a rock. He walked into a hospital for elective spine surgery that is done millions of times in a year in the U.S. But he had a respiratory arrest on the first night after surgery on a dilated PCA while his wife was in the room. Absolutely tragic and unnecessary. And 16 years after the incident of medicine report, we have patients still dying needl needlessly from our medical treatments, in, our, in this case, opioids, uh, that we could potentially prevent. And again, this doesn't, respiratory monitoring and continuous respiratory monitoring doesn't pertain just to opioids. It pertains to all conditions, sepsis, heart failure, that we might be able to detect earlier. So there are now uh, technologies available that allow patients on the ward to be monitored conveniently and continuously, and they are shown in the left column here. Uh, the respiratory vital signs we can monitor as the ones on the right, and many of uh, the most important, tele you know, the important ones obviously tell us about oxygenation and ventilation, two reasons we breathe. Uh, take your pick. I'm not going to go into detail, that's for a different lecture, but here we have some pictures of some of these in use. Uh, the monitor goes on the finger, the pulse ox, everyone's familiar with that one. There are also versions of the pulse ox, as you know, they go on the wrist, on the ear, in the nose. In the nose, there's actually a technology that will measure both saturation and airflow. On the chest, or even under your mattress, not even attached to the patient. They all give data on whether you're ventilating and or oxygenating, which is critical to, to life. And in 2019, nobody should stop breathing in, breathing in a hospital bed on a ward undetected. This is something we can address now. 
So in a few minutes, Dr. Khan, I will tell you more about the Prodigy study, but I'll just introduce it here. Prodigy, uh, very cleverly, uh, is the prediction of opioid-induced respiratory depressions in patients monitored by capnography. Actually, it has continuous oximetry as well, but uh, Prodigy is the, is the acronym. Patients who are receiving parenteral opioids, I, IV, uh, either for post-operative or medical pain were monitored with continuous pulse oximetry and capnography for up to 72 hours. The providers at the bedside were blinded to the monitors. Just like at the Cleveland Clinic study, they could not see the monitors. The data was analyzed for opioid-induced respiratory depression events that were defined by one or more of the five conditions you see there. A prolonged desaturation below 85%, a prolonged or low respiratory rate, a prolonged high or low end tidal CO2 late, an apneic event lasting more than 30 seconds, or a respiratory event that we noted in the chart was caused by opioids, or likely caused by opioids, such as the administration of Narcan or positive pressure ventilation. The monitoring data was then corroborated with the clinical bedside data from the chart by a panel of four experts, our clinical evaluation committee, to make sure the monitor artifact was not misinterpreted. One of the reasons it's set for greater than three minutes is to uh, reduce the amount of artifact that potentially could be introduced. But so there was a really stringent, the bar was set really high for counting these episodes of respiratory compromised. And I promised earlier I would show you how these continuous monitors can show problems with oxygenation and ventilation uh, that you can't tell with a Q4R oximetry spot check it's all about trends. Of course, our alarms are set by thresholds, but trends tell you a lot more. And let's see if you can, if I can explain these two gra graphs here. The top one is the capnography tracing with closely sp spaced lines and gaps. If this patient were breathing normally, there wouldn't be any gaps in this picket fence. You see this capnography tracing is, is compressed, but you wouldn't have these gaps in there. If this patient was breathing rhythmically and norm normally, but you see what's happening if you look at the oxygen saturation below it in red and the heart rate is in green. This is a patient with obstructive sleep apnea who stops breathing every few minutes, as shown by the gap in the picket fence and the light blue up top, and the corresponding valleys in the red oxygenation saturation trend underneath. You see these, these dips in the pulse ox. We know that these are real because the rush of adrenaline this patient has every time they become an hypoxic, he stops breathing, is accompanied by a spike in heart rate, which is the green spikes. You see those correspond just after the drop in oxygen saturation. Now, if you walked into this patient's room and awoke him to take a spot check oxygen, you would likely not see this because you'd probably stimulate them and catch them at the top of these spikes. So this is a great example how with continuous monitoring, we can actually see people who get in trouble by looking at trends and patterns not just simple thresholds. Here we see the same pattern, and we see this pattern, but this patient actually does get into trouble and required Narcan at that purple dotted line to reverse respiratory compromise. And you can see that he, uh, he or she was doing the same thing. You have, again, the gaps in the picket fence, and then you see around 10.06, you see that you start to get these big dips in the saturation with the corresponding speaks, uh, spikes in the heart rate. And fortunately for this patient, uh, somebody walked by the room, was in the room, and the patient was able to be resuscitated, um, which is unfortunately what we don't have with a number of other patients. And I'm going to finish up before I go to Dr. Kana with our last uh, patient, who, who, the story of Kim. And Kim was overweight, and she had severe sleep apnea. She was CPAP dependent and loved her CPAP machine, and she was told to bring it to the hospital, and she dutifully did so, as instructed for use uh, after her orthopedic procedure. She received a variety of opioid drugs by different routes for the first six, 36 hours post-op, but unfortunately she was found tragically in respiratory arrest with her CPAP mask under her bed. Apparently, nobody, nobody noticed or concerned that the mask was not on in the setting of giving her opioids. Again, tragic and preventable. Uh, I'm going to turn the mic over now to Dr. Kana. Uh, are you uh, ready, Ashish?
Yes, Frank, and uh, thank you. And um, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever across the world you're tuned into this. Uh, it's been a very exciting first half of this uh, webinar, and I hope to continue the excitement uh, moving forward as I speak to you all about the derivation and validation of a novel opioid-induced respiratory depression risk prediction tool. In so many words, I am going to be speaking to you all about the uh, mechanism of conduct, the execution, the orchestration, and the results of the Prodigy trial, and what those results really uh, mean to us, and what, what those results will mean to the clinical community. Just going over our learning objectives for my my part of this webinar today. Uh, firstly, like I just said, I will discuss the organization and design of a, a continuous respiratory monitoring trial, in this case, the Prodigy trial. And I'll also discuss the implications of the risk score, the Prodigy risk score that was developed from the Prodigy trial and how it impacts us as clinicians and healthcare providers in the prediction of respiratory compromise on the general care floor. So as a start, I want to just highlight four major points as ground rules for the situation that we're facing today. Frank has already done a great job in setting the stage, and most of this is just a reiteration of what Frank just presented to all of you. So the general care floors, we call them hospital wards, inpatient wards, general floors, nursing units, whatever whatever uh, the terminology, the appropriate terminology may be in your particular hospital setting. Most of us transfer patients to the floor after the post anesthesia care unit or after a stay in a medical or surgical ICU. Some patients go there directly from the emergency room. Some patients are admitted onto the general care floor directly. Now the thought is that most patients are on a trajectory of recovery when they're going to the general care floor, that they have um, gone past their initial medical or surgical insult, and that the general care floor is really a transition to them going home. This, however, is not always the case. Literature shows us that acute, sudden cardiorespiratory depression or cardiorespiratory compromise events, the so-called code blue events, or the rapid response team activations that lead up to these code blue events, are alarmingly common on the general care floor. And again, Frank has has shown us a lot of that data, but the bottom line is that when a patient crashes on the general care floor, the overall outcomes are way worse than if the same patient had crashed on in a monitored setting. Now there are several reasons for uh, respiratory depression events on the general care floor. However, opioid-induced respiratory depression, or OIRD, is a potential cause of these events, and not just a potential cause, it is a often underreported and uh, not appropriately measured cause of these events. All our patients are on analgesics, either after surgery or because of medical reasons. Most patients need opioids for appropriate analgesia, and as Frank showed in the slides leading up to this, there is tons and tons of cases of poor innocent patients who are on the floor, they're recovering, they have, they, they're they going to go out uh, on a Monday, it's it's a Saturday night, and something happens. And that is what the, the whole uh, conundrum of this problem is. Now, if I translate this into some real numbers, literature has said that and OIRD usually would increase hospital length of stay by about five days, would lead to higher readmission rates into hospitals, and also approximately increase healthcare costs by about a mean of $10,000. Certainly numbers that we cannot afford to ignore. Now what does, uh, what is the real situation on the general care floor in terms of how we are doing surveillance for our patients? The important point is monitoring. 
So it looks like these events are really common and we can't really predict from them to our best knowledge as of today. So if we can't really do that, we need to monitor our patients more aggressively. However, what we're doing right now is snapshots of time monitoring on the general care floor. Every four to six hours, there is a healthcare provider that goes to a patient's room or patient's bedside on the patient's vital signs and the patient's well-being. Those vital signs are recorded somewhere in the EMR and, and then the patient is left in the dark for lack of better words. Now, data uh, from the Cleveland Clinic Outcomes Research Group that did continuous hypoxemia monitoring on patients showed that up to 90% of episodes of prolonged hypoxemia defined as oxygen saturations less than 90% for at least an hour of monitoring time were missed. So nearly all of the patients in that cohort analysis had episodes of hypoxemia that were significant and prolonged that were consistently missed using snapshots in time monitoring. Knowing all of this information, we set off on the Prodigy trial. The Prodigy trial, again, simplistically speaking, is the prediction of opioid-induced respiratory depression in patients monitored by capnography. And really, our basic aim was to investigate the incidence of OIRD in patients who received parenteral opioids on the hospital ward using continuous cardiorespiratory monitoring. This cardiorespiratory monitoring was a combination of continuous capnography and oximetry. And in terms of variables, we looked at heart rate, oxygen saturation, and tidal CO2 and respiratory rate, all of them continuously recorded in a blinded and silenced alarms monitor that was at the patient's bedside. Let me move on further and expand a little bit on the study design and enrollment. We had 16 sites across the world, sites in the US, in Europe, and in Asia. And this is, a, this amongst many other things, is a novelty of the Prodigy trial. And we hope that the gold mine of data that we're going to, um, you know, have at the end of the trial is going to not just speak to opioid-induced respiratory depression, but it is also going to speak to the cultural diversity of medical practice across the world, especially when it comes to using opioids, and how patients across different hospitals, hospital environments, and, and maybe also across different genetic makeups respond to opioids and opioid-induced respiratory depression. Having said that, we screened about 2,000 initial patients for eligibility, and our final cohort had 1,335 patients. All of these patients had at least an hour or up to 48 hours of continuous cardiorespiratory monitoring. And all of these patients had at least <clears throat> parenteral opioids used during this monitoring time. Now these 1,335 patients in the final cohort for analyses had periodic checks done by research fellows and coordinators and research nurses to make sure that there was integrity uh, to the monitoring and that the waveform data collected was as accurate as possible. Now remember bedside monitors that were recording all of this data were blinded and silenced to the healthcare provider. The nurses at the bedside were still doing their regular Q4, Q6 hours vital signs checks. This meant that we were not disturbing any kind of nursing vital signs checks protocol and we were not compromising patient safety. However, we were, we were collecting in the background all of these natural variations in, in respiratory and heart rate patterns in response to all the medications that were being used or given and that would allow us to develop the predictive analytics model that we finally did. Our study went on to a month afterwards and the final cohort that, that completed follow-up was 1,282 patients. So like I said, we, we used predictive analytics and we came up with a Prodigy risk score. How did this happen? First of all, we defined respiratory depression or what is a respiratory depressive episode. Frank has already spoken to this in his slides, but I'd just like to re-emphasize what these 
uh, what the uh, parameters for respiratory depression were. We defined all of these a priori. We used respiratory rate less than five breaths per minute, oxygen saturation less than 85%, end tidal less than 15 or greater than 60, any apnea episode lasting more than 30 seconds, or any respiratory opioid related adverse event. Now it's important to note that respiratory rate, oxygen saturation, and end tidal CO2 had to be less than or more, or in case of entitled CO2, greater than a certain threshold for a continuous three minutes or more. These thresholds were, were specifically made um, slightly more aggressive, so to speak, so as to eliminate all sorts of false positives. Now remember again that any respiratory array, as, as I've mentioned here, was also predefined in the study protocol that we have published separately in the Journal of Critical Care. Once all of once all the monitoring data was collected at the bedside in a blinded and silenced fashion, it was sent to a group of three experts in perioperative sleep and respiratory medicine. These experts were not investigators on the trial. And these independent experts constituted what we call the clinical event committee, and they adjudicated many thousands of hours of waveform data and were able to determine what was a true opioid-induced respiratory depression event versus what was just a respiratory depression episode versus what was all noise and artifact. This, amongst others, is another big novelty of Prodigy. No study to date has recorded all this waveform data and has independently adjudicated that data to make sure that it is clean and validated. We finally used about 46 potential predictors listed in literature and we plugged them in with all the respiratory depression episodes that the clinical event committee marked off to design a multivariate risk prediction model that came up with the Prodigy risk score. Going on further, this is the overall outlay of demographics for Prodigy. A very busy slide, I apologize. However, just knowing all of the data points and the across three continents nature of Prodigy, there is a lot of data here to look through. There's some stories here that are worth mention and some of them that are pretty evident knowing our clinical practice. Patients in the United States were on the heavier side with, with, with a higher BMI. They had a higher neck circumference in general and consequently higher stop bank scores. Further, patients in the US had more of a ASA 3 and 4 categorization than Europe and Asia, which meant sicker patients in general. And then going on down here, the opioid naivety situation as expected in the US, only about 70% patients were opioid naive, whereas almost all patients in Asia were opioid naive. Further, about a third of pa the patients in, 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 in the US were on at least four or more opioids at any one given time. Some of this is not unexpected, but again, as I said before, this is a rich data set that really helped us separate, separate and segregate how, how patients do and behave in terms of opioid-related opioid respiratory depression in response to opioids. The univariate prediction model had a number of predictors that, predicted, that were seen more commonly in patients with one or more respiratory depression episodes. They ranged from increasing age, male sex, BMI, a number of cardiac disorders, metabolic disorders, renal and urinary disorders, a number of prominent respiratory disorders, and the number of opioids used. However, after final adjustment in a multivariate uh, risk prediction model, this is what our Prodigy risk score looks like. We have five easy to use variables. The first one is age age greater than 60 in increments of every decade was the strongest predictor of, of a OIRD or a respiratory depressive episode as defined by Prodigy. 
male sex, chronic heart failure, opioid naivety, and sleep disorder, breathing or general sleep disorders in terms of risks on a stop bank score. All of this constituted the Prodigy risk score distribution. If you look to the extreme right hand side on your slides here, every score was given a clinical weightage or a point and the scores added up. So the maximum Prodigy risk score is a score of 39 and the minimum is zero. Looking down below, you can see that there's three risk categories that we created, low risk less than eight points, intermediate risk 8 to 15 points, and high risk greater than 15 points. Let me take a quick example here. Suppose I have a patient who is somewhere between 70 to 80 years old. That scores as 12 on the Prodigy score. The same patient now has chronic heart failure. That's an additional 7 points. That a total of 19 points would put this patient in the high risk category for the Prodigy risk score. Now the highest risk category, looking at just our cohort for the Prodigy trial, we had about 65% patients in the highest risk category, 24% patients in the lowest risk category, and about 42% patients in the intermediate risk. It is important to note that all three risk categories had had risk separation, which means that all three risk categories had a significantly separated odds ratio of the risk of an OIRD. For example, someone in the highest risk had a six times greater likelihood of experiencing an OIRD as defined by Prodigy compared to a patient in the lowest risk category. And I, as I just said, this risk separation was maintained across the risk score categories. So the Prodigy risk score is important, it's, it's accurate, and it's certainly something that can be done at the bedside by any and every healthcare provider. Moving on further, I talked about accuracy. We had an ROC AUC or an or a receiver operating characteristic for an area under the curve of about 0 0.7606. So we, the score correctly predicted OIRD about 76% of times. And on the right side of the screen, you see a predicted to observe probability of RD. Our calibration plot fitted well, even at extremes of risk. Prodigy certainly does not stop at just the incidence of uh, the respiratory depressive episodes and the Prodigy risk score. The secondary outcomes of Prodigy are to look at end tidal CO2, SpO2, respiratory rate, and a combination in the form of the integrated pulmonary index in predicting which of these, either alone or in combination, would have the highest sensitivity and specificity to, to determine accurately an opioid-induced respiratory depressive episode. And then some of the exploratory outcomes with Prodigy are also looking at incidence of overall adverse events, healthcare cost-effective analyses, 30-day hospital readmission rates that are reportable to, to, to governmental agencies, and then overall hospital lengths of stay as well. Most of this data is still in the pipeline and will be available once our full Prodigy paper is out, hopefully somewhere uh, in the summer itself. So to conclude, respiratory depressive episodes are common. Frank and I have highlighted that the regular nursing floor is certainly not entirely all a safe haven, certainly not a safe haven, keeping in mind the monitoring protocols that we have set in place today. Now remember that all respiratory depressive episodes do not necessarily translate into clinical respiratory depressive events. Having said that, respiratory depressive episodes in the form of profound hypoxemia or hypoventilation, hypercapnia, cannot be taken lightly. We know that these episodes are a pattern. As Frank described, a <coughs> black box that shows that a pay, pay, plane is likely to crash or why a plane crashed is so important to uncover because 
respiratory depressive episodes as such may lead to further morbidity and mor mortality, some of which we know and some of which we don't know at this moment. Keeping that in mind, the Prodigy Risk Score is certainly something that's a five-variable, easy-to-use score, can be done on every single patient as the patient goes into a regular nursing floor environment. Once you have the Prodigy Risk Score recorded on your EMR or wherever you want to record it, knowing that score, you can then triage your patients. You can put your patient on a continuous monitoring protocol. You can have your patient have more effective therapeutic proactive interventions, whether it's diuretics, whether it's beta blockade, whether it's other heart failure medications, whether it's it's proactively putting consult services on that patient to make sure that patient is better taken care of. It, it is ultimately a combination of all of this that will lead to a better and safer outcomes outcome for our patients who reside on the general care floor. And as Frank said, we owe this to our patients. They need to get out of the hospital safely if they pay all of this for their healthcare costs. Thank you for your time and attention. With that, I come to the end of my section on this webinar. I am going to hand this over to Carla, who will move us forward with the question and answer session. Well, thank you, Dr. Karan and Dr. Overdyke for this most insightful uh, presentation. Uh, we are, uh, as a reminder, offering CME and CNE and CRCN. Uh, this activity has been approved for one contact hour for physicians, nurse anesthetists, nurses, and respiratory therapists. Go to uh, saxtesting.com uh, forward slash INIT. Uh, you will need to register on the test site, complete the evaluation, and upon uh, successful uh, submission, you'll be able to print your certificate and as a reminder uh, support for this activity has been provided by Medtronic. Uh, we had so many uh, excellent questions um, and I would like to start out by asking Dr. Overdyke. Um, I have a question from Julie. Uh, why uh, are, are patients being monitored with O2 and, and not end tidal CO2? Uh, good question, Julie. So, end tidal CO2 is a slightly more complex uh, technology to implement at the bedside. Obviously, there's a nasal cannula that needs to be correctly positioned. The pulse ox is ergonomically a little easier. You put it on the finger, and uh, so patients who are on the ward, typically when they're moving around, eating, talking to their families, it's easier to do that with uh, pulse oximetry. Um, capnography, however, helps us with interpreting those ventilation patterns that I showed you and is extremely helpful. Now, there are several institutions that have started with continuous ox oximetry and decided to abandon it and go straight to only a capnography. But that's, and they found that most useful for a number of reasons, which uh, we, I, I can let you know uh, offline. But so every, every institution finds the type of monitoring that fits their, their needs. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Khanna, um, uh, I think a quick question for you to answer is, during the Prodigy study, how is opioid na uh, naivete defined? Thanks, Carla. It's a good question. Um, very simplistically speaking, we looked at the EMR, and if on the EMR, the patient had no record of uh, opioid use in the past as recorded on the EMR and in the history provided by the patient, we documented that, that patient as opioid naive. I do agree that it would not be a 100% fail safe, but uh, this was, uh, you know, in keeping with the trial, this was the best that could have been done. Uh, thank you. Dr. Overdyke, um, can you suggest how, uh, this is Jeremy's question, how do I get my administration to support continuous monitoring when the initial cost is significant? So Jeremy, the, the cost of continuous monitoring has come down. There's different pricing models that places uh, have and use, and uh, it's, it's a different paradigm now than it was 15, 20 years ago. But one way you can, uh, the healthcare environment has become very competitive and I referred you to that link as to 
what your outcomes for failure to rescue are at your institution. Now, if you're in the top 5 or 10%, maybe you can argue, the, the C-suite might argue, but that's not important. But again, we have a responsibility to take care of all our patients, not most of our patients. And I think we, in this age, in 2019, using technology where we can actually prevent and uh, pre to reduce preventable harm is extremely important. And with your get with with your uh, failure to rescue data, your code team, your code blue data, you can make a case for continuous monitoring for many, many of your patients. Um, thank you. And sort of an add-on to that, Amy is asking, should all patients on opioids be continuously monitored? And what would the length of treatment, do they have to be monitored ongoing? Um, so Amy, that that is, uh, in my opinion, obviously, yes. And, and I, I've shown some, some cases, obviously, that are tragic and completely preventable. If it was my family or friends uh, going in, I would like to be monitored continuously. I don't trust spot checks. And um, typically, it should be done for the duration of you receiving parental opioids. But now we have much shorter hospital stays, so people get transitioned to PO opioids. And if you're taking opioids by mouth, there is some risk, but it's considerably less. It's, and remember, there are, we, we are not fail-safe. We make mistakes in, in, in healthcare, and a lot of these cases relate to mistakes or with education or with training or with knowledge about opioids. So, so the answer to your question is yes, and uh, probably so long as parental opioids are being used. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Khanna, uh, Ted is asking, how would you suggest employing the prodigy findings into practice? Yes, Ted. Um, I, I, again, good question. So, um, as I said when I was finishing up, the the strength of the Prodigy score is that you don't need a you know separate calculator. You don't need to go online anywhere. These are things when you first admit your patient on the floor, you can look at the chart and essentially determine all of the five variables. Uh, once you've done that, you document that on admission. Uh, that will give you a risk of <coughs> of OIRD as determined by our three levels of risk that we've created. And then you should probably work with the entire clinical team and say, hey, my patient is at intermediate risk. Um, what should I do? And then look at the entire clinical picture and say, okay, maybe based on his intermediate risk and based on the fact that we have continuous monitoring available, we should put this person on continuous monitoring at least for the first 12 hours of the stay on the floor. At the end of 12 hours, we could, uh, you know, uh, we could look at everything again. Now, the Prodigy score is certainly a static score. It's not going to change at the end of 12 hours. But what could change is your patient's clinical picture. Then you could decide what, what to do for the next 24 hours and then go from there. The bottom line is that a higher Prodigy score certainly has you alerted and puts all eyes on a patient and certainly gives a better surveillance protocol for your patient. Um, thank you. Um, I have uh, uh, several people who have asked, is the tool available? Is it published? Uh, Dr. Khanna, can you answer that question? Sure, and I can um, sense the excitement and I can tell you that uh, we are awaiting full publication of our primary manuscript. Uh, at that stage, the school tool will be officially published. Having said that, uh, we have presented, I did present this data at the Society of Critical Care Medicine's annual congress in February this year. So the risk score itself, uh, that data has been presented and uh, you know that that abstract is available in the journal critical care medicine um, you're free to start using that risk score or in your current uh, work environment and see what you uh, make of it um, but in terms of the full paper yes very soon uh, thank you 
Um, just to the audience, uh, we're going to go over by about five minutes because we have so many wonderful questions. Please make uh, uh, sure that you check off at noon if you really need to on the top of the hour, but you can catch the rest of the questions on replay uh, when it comes out in about 10 days. Uh, Dr. Khanna, um, I have a patient that's asking, or a, a, a Jennifer who's asking, uh, all of our patients on parental o opioids on the nurse care floor are on oxygen, supplemental oxygen. Did the Prodigy study include measurements of those people on supplemental oxygen, uh, and did it make a difference in the findings? <coughs> So Jennifer, um, in, in the absence of the full publication being out, um, I, I cannot dwell into a lot of uh, details, but what I can answer is that supplemental oxygen, like you said, is a commonality on the general care floor. It lulls us into this false sense of well-being, thinking that we've corrected the oxygen saturation, our numbers look okay, so our patient is okay. Uh, like anywhere else, the Prodigy cohort had a lot of supplemental oxygen use. We wanted to keep it as close to real world as possible. We did not mandate the use or, or not use of a certain amount of supplemental oxygen. Yes, the data in the end had a lot of supplemental oxygen mixed in, but to, to, to kind of expand further, that is the reason why the ventilatory categories of the of the continuous monitoring data would be really, really, really useful. And you know, when you read the full paper, you will understand why I'm saying this, uh, and and how important they would be in in designing a score like this. Uh, Jennifer also is asking, uh, is, how is the Prodigy score compared to the Stop Bang questionnaire that's commonly used in clinical practice? Again, great question, Jennifer. Um, Francis Chung's group has done a remarkable job. It's, it's a landmark step in the way we look at our patients perioperatively. Uh, but the stop bank questionnaire is fundamentally very different. It is a, uh, you know, a questionnaire that, that's presented to a patient usually in the preoperative environment and es essentially assesses for the risk of obstructive sleep apnea that's uh, undiagnosed. Um, the Prodigy score, on the other hand, looks at the risk of an opioid-induced respiratory depression event or episode on the general care floor, uh, and the score was is designed based on continuous monitoring data. So all of the continuous monitoring data constituted what would be called a, an OIRD episode, and that went into uh, designing the Prodigy risk score that would determine the risk of this episode, whereas the stop bank score is a risk for obstructive sleep apnea and only obstructive sleep apnea, not a risk for how the patient does in terms of behavior to narcotics. Um, thank you. Uh, Dr. Overdyke, uh, Pamela is asking, uh, what do we do with those patients who refuse to wear their CPAP? Um, well, Pamela, as you know, uh, at least the old CPAP machines, 70 to 80 percent of the patients were non-compliant with them. The new technology is better. Um, I, th I think this is an education part on the patients, on, on our responsibility to educate the patients that when they're receiving opioids, specifically parental opioids, their chances of, of having a serious catastrophic event are much higher. The CPAP is not the same as when they use it at home. In that setting, it's sort of a perfect storm, and to be safe, they need to uh, be compliant with it. Now, a patient who receives significant opioids post-surgically is not going to be uh, awake, alert, and oriented all the time. So we have a responsibility to provi providers to make sure that that patient understands that they need it and that we actually make sure that they have it for the periods of time that are critical, which is typically when they're sleeping or when they're, they're sedated. Um, thank you. So, uh, 
Uh, Dr. Khanna, um, this question is about the three risk categories on the Prodigy um, results that you reported. Um, should all patients in just the high risk category be continuous monitored? Or are you saying that the patients in the, in the lower risk categories would not need continuous monitoring? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> In, 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 if you really ask me, um, I would want all patients on the general care floor to have continuous, portable, smarter monitoring systems. Um, I, I honestly don't think any patient should be left unmonitored just because the, the, the downstream consequences of events that we're missing is, you know, is, uh, as Frank reported, some of them cost patients very dearly. So I would hate to leave patients unmonitored just because they are low on the Prodigy risk score. Having said that, it's important to understand that it's not always easy to monitor all patients continuously on the general care floor. So the Prodigy risk score gives us a triage tool. And if anything, not doesn't just push us to continuous monitoring, it also pushes us to more proactive therapeutic intervention intervention that could be respiratory, that could be cardiac, could be a combination, could be, you know, more appropriate analgesia, or maybe you, know, you can try using opioid sparing analgesics on some of these patients if they're so sensitive to narcotics. So it is a guide to help us understand what patients are likely to deteriorate. In the best case scenario, everyone should have continuous monitoring. Um, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we have many excellent questions, but we are out of time. I want to thank everyone who attended uh, today's webinar. Um, and uh, now Emily has a few final instructions for the audience. It was really wonderful. I'd like to thank you very much for your time, Drs. Frank and Ashish. And as well, thank you to you, Carla, for being our moderator today. And I'd like to thank each and every one of you, our guests in the live audience today, and as well those of you in a future time who are attending this recorded session. We thank you for your time and your thoughtful attention. And now this does conclude our session for today. Take care, everyone, and bye for now. We'll see you again next time.